Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? It's Fawn Desi and Deborah Fabos. We are with Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance of Kern County, affiliated with the national organization as the only uh, national organization that deals exclusively uh, with helping people and their families who have schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. So uh, you can go ahead and turn the slide. Um, our entire policy is directed towards improving and saving lives of people with uh, these psychotic disorders, including schizophrenia. So we're committed to changing the treatment paradigm and accelerating scientific knowledge, promoting policies that improve and save lives. And particularly, I think, for us, ensuring that treatment is provided in a timely and effective manner for people who have these disorders and their loved ones caregivers, family who need to have the um, resources made available and need to have the information that we are going to help provide. So towards that goal, one of the things that comes to mind is the uh, MET team or um, it's the, the evaluation team that goes out when there is a mental health crisis and does the evaluation for a 5150 hold or some other services that might be needed by a person who has a brain disorder. So towards that end, you can turn the next uh, slide if you if you can. We're going to um, provide you with connecting information for Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance, our website, our local Facebook page and where you can send donations if you like what you hear and what we're able to present to you. So one of the things that, that we thought would be important to everybody is to hear what our uh, mobile evaluation team does, how to connect with them, and how to basically be able to present a, a position that hopefully will lead to some assistance for your loved one who may have a psychotic disorder or schizophrenia. So the person that we are interviewing today is Emily Lyles. She has been involved in the behavioral health system for 17 years as a licensed clinical social worker. She has um, been involved in supervising the mobile evaluation team for the last nine years, I believe it is, and she is also a co-chair for the uh, crisis intervention team. So Emily has some very pertinent information for families of those who have a relative who has a brain disorder that may require immediate uh, intervention in, in the form of becoming a danger to self or others. So with that lead in, I am going to introduce you to Emily Lyles of Kern BHRS. Emily? Thank you, Fawn. I am honored to be here today to, to share information about Kern BHRS's mobile evaluation team. Next slide. Today, what we're going to cover is what is the mobile evaluation team? Where did the idea for a mobile crisis team come from? What does MET do and how do we do this? New things on the horizon or the forefront, and we'll also take questions. Next slide. Here's a beautiful picture of our team a few years back down by the Kern River in our backyard here. Um, and what you'll notice is all of the MET staff members are in uniforms. Um, that's so they can be readily identified on the scene of a crisis. So what the MET team does is they are a specialized crisis intervention unit 
that responds at the request of all law enforcement agencies in Kern County to the scene of a behavioral health crisis. Next slide. Currently, there are 11 recovery specialists on our team, one therapist, and three co-response units that work directly in a law enforcement patrol car who are partnered with officers. Um, the current MET team is on duty from 7 a.m. to 12.30 a.m. Um, with the hopes to return to a 24-7 shift very soon. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about where the idea of MET teams came from. Um, and without getting too far into the history, I do want to start in the year 1967, and I'll tell you why. That is when the three attorneys, Lannerman, Petrus, and Short, um, sought to end the inappropriate, indefinite, and involuntary commitment of people with mental health disorders to state hospitals or insane asylums. Um, and it also established a right to prompt psychiatric evaluation and treatment in some situations and set out a strict due process protection for the individuals with the mental health disorders, which is what we refer to now as the Welfare and Institutions Code 5150, which is a term that many people have heard at some point in time. So the idea for MET came from just this, um, the whole process of deinstitutionalization, which really encouraged community-based treatment and provided people with mental health disorders rights um, to be a part of treatment, to consent to treatment, to help make collaborative decisions regarding their treatment. Um, and a part of the evolution of people with mental health disorders being transitioned from inpatient long-term settings, there became this new issue that was law enforcement becoming the default first responders for people in a behavioral health crisis. Um, what this looks like is, and some of you who may have family members who experience a mental illness is, if you could imagine having a family member in a state hospital or an inpatient type of setting for treatment for years, and then all of a sudden saying, you know what, we'd like you to go home. We'd like you to try community-based treatment in a community of your choice. Um, and you're gonna have rights to help make decisions regarding your treatment. Um, what happens when someone returns to independent living or to their family and there's a crisis? Um, there's a relapse. What happens? Um, well, I know for myself, if if something happens and it's an emergency, I call 911. Um, and that's how this has unfolded to law enforcement becoming the first responders for behavioral health crises. Um, next slide. So what is MET's role in this now? Um, the MET team responds to these behavioral health crises that law enforcement is also responding to. So if someone calls 911 for a behavioral health crisis and someone needs immediate assistance, that means that law enforcement is going to respond and they will have the opportunity to request a mobile evaluation team staff member. That staff member will go directly to the scene of the crisis and provide crisis intervention. And if necessary, if the individual is, is not willing to accept voluntary treatment, then that MET staff member can also provide the Welfare and Institutions Code 5150 evaluation to determine if 
this person is meeting criteria and if there is probable cause for an involuntary um, admission. Next slide. So how does MET know where to go and what to do? Um, this is a good visual aid of just that. Um, we do have our laptop um, that's mobile and able to connect in our vehicles. Um, we have radios in our cars and handheld radios. So we have a radio on us at all times. And the interior of our vehicles are semi patrol car ish, I would say. They do have a cage to help keep our clients and our staff secure. Um, and so, how do we use this equipment? Well, when a men's staff comes into work for their shift, what they do is they log on with the radios. Um, my MET staff are in constant communication with our city and county law enforcement agencies. And the radios is how they communicate and let them know when they're available to take a call. And also when they're busy, um, if, if they are safe or if they need additional assistance, um, and having the laptop readily available is also helpful um, because our med staff are behavioral health staff and we do have access to our clients information. So we are able to access the emergency contact. Um, we are able to access any special information that we need at the scene of a crisis. And maybe an example of that would be specific behavioral health interventions um, that help verbally de-escalate and bring the client back to a safe level of functioning. Next slide. This is actually a picture of our virtual MET program. Um, it's an iPad with a Zoom software. Um, one thing that we like to make sure of is that we are responding to these behavioral health crises in the most timely manner as possible. Um, with the Senate Bill 82, it was referred to as the Investment and in Mental Health Well Act of 2013. We were able to obtain grant funds for hardware and software. Um, the purpose of the grant was to be able to expand timely access to crisis services across our vast area um, of over 8,162 square miles of Kern County. Um, we started a pilot program in 2016 with the iPads and the Zoom software licenses. And what we found is that using this in partnership with the Sheriff's Office and other outlying area law enforcement agencies helped decrease our response time greatly. And it also assisted in allowing people to voluntarily accept treatment in their home communities. Next slide. Sometimes it helps to show some data and numbers when providing information about our team. Um, and by this slide, you can tell our team is busy. Um, in fiscal year 2021, we responded to over 4,100 calls for service. Um, you can see just over 3,500 were adults, 676 were children. One thing that has stayed consistent for many years on our team is that the MET staff are able to effectively engage the, the adults and children that we work with to help them accept and engage in voluntary treatment. 
Um, so what this looks like for adults is 34% of adults were placed on 5150s, but 66% of adults were able to remain in the community and get connected or re-engaged with outpatient treatment. With the children, 43% were placed on 5150s and almost 60% were able to remain in the community. Next slide. And earlier when I was talking about the MET staff and how we respond to the location of the crisis, as you can imagine, some of these crisis situations result in individuals needing emergency medical evaluation and or treatment. Um, so for fiscal year 2021, um, this is showing we had 86 virtual MET calls. This includes outlying areas and the school calls that we get. Um, Kern High School District does have access to some iPads and um, being that our office is located on the east side of town and sometimes we get calls and rush hour traffic to high schools on the opposite end of town, we have found virtual med is sometimes a really effective way to engage with um, adolescents. We also had 943 hospital calls. These include calls where people are in the ER. This includes calls where people have been admitted for a longer length of time onto a medical floor for treatment. 778 of those hospital calls were for adults and 165 were for minors. In these instances, the process is the same. Um, we're able to check and see if the individual is already connected with behavioral health treatment and we're able to, you know, let their outpatient team know what's going on. If they're not already connected, we're able to help the hospital social work staff and doctors get these individuals connected. Um, and we're also able to provide the same interventions we provide on all other calls. You know, we provide crisis intervention, and if we aren't able to voluntarily work with the individual, we can provide the 5150 evaluation. Next slide. So what's on the forefront? This is always the exciting part. How are we growing and expanding and changing? Um, right now, at this point in time, we have a MET staff, one, in the Bakersfield City Police Department's Communication Center. And what the dispatchers are able to do is they are able to transfer her calls that are related to behavioral health issues um, and those are the calls that don't require a 911 response. If someone calls in reporting that they're experiencing suicidal thoughts and they have a plan for suicide and they have the means to complete the plan, that is obviously going to require a law enforcement officer to respond. Um, if someone calls in reporting depression, um, or maybe there, there's a situational crisis that has occurred that they're needing to cope with. Um, those are the types of calls that will get transferred to our MET staff who's in the communication center. Um, right now, we are in the pilot phase of this project um, and we'll be reviewing outcomes soon for future. Um, what else do we have going on? Well, right now we have been allocated by the county um, four positions, four MET units who will be partnered up with Bakersfield City Police Department officers to provide homeless outreach. Um, and, you know, they will really be working closely with our other Kern BHRS homeless outreach teams 
Um, but they will also be unique in the fact they will be able to assist and respond to in-progress calls for service. Um, and what that might look like is if they're out outreaching to some homeless and they there's a call that comes in for someone who's experiencing suicidal thoughts or homicidal thoughts due to a mental disorder, um, then they will have the option to respond to that if necessary. We've also been allocated four positions for the Sheriff's Office that will be dedicated to responding to calls with the Sheriff's Department. So what this looks like is they won't be riding in the same vehicle as a deputy. However, they will be responding to only calls in the county's jurisdiction. Um, the, the last thing I want to talk about is that we also have one other thing on the forefront, which is we will be partnering one more MET staff with a deputy who will be working in the metro uh, vicinity of Kern County responding to crisis calls. Next slide. <clears throat> So at this point in time, I am going to open it up to questions. Wow, wow that is wow. great, Emily. I'm getting some feedback here. This is Deborah Fabos. You can't see me because I'm on the phone, but um, that's a lot of great information on the MET team here in Kern County. Um, the questions that I do have are from Fawn, myself, and some questions that members from our Facebook page um, wrote in about. So um, I guess I'll just get started with them. So you mentioned the, the members of the MET team, and they, they just sound fabulous. Do you have like a minimum requirement for the members on the team? For instance, what level of education or any kind of minimal experience, minimum, sorry, experience with working with individuals with psychosis? That's a great question, Deborah, and we do. Um, so the qualifications are a little more advanced for our team um, than an ordinary outpatient provider. Um, so within the county's job descriptions, um, there is what is called a behavioral health recovery specialist series, and there are different levels. There's a behavioral health recovery specialist one, two, and three. On our team, we accept two as the base level, and what it requires to be a recovery specialist two minimum um, is completion of 60 semester or 90 quarter units of coursework from an accredited college or university and three years of full-time paid experience working with the chronically mentally ill in a mental health setting. Um, for the recovery specialist three, it does require a bachelor's degree um, but we also accept uh, mental health therapist, uh, pre-licensure, working towards licensure or licensed, of course, um, and as well as psychiatric technicians or vocational nurses. And these job descriptions are actually posted on our Kern County um, public website. Great, good to know. So anyone who's curious, they can just go on there and look them up. Absolutely. That's awesome. So do you, I noticed that um, you don't have any EMTs or medically trained individuals on the team. Is that correct? We actually have two LVNs on our team. Um, oh, OK. Yes. That's great. That's great. 
And is, yeah. is that something that you look for or did it just, I'm just curious. Um, is there a reason that you have them on there? You know, they actually fall under the recovery specialist three job classification. I will tell you, um, it's not something that I necessarily look for, but it is a huge bonus um, for our team members, especially when we're working with some more challenging comorbid cases that are in our hospital setting. And maybe they have a chronic or acute medical condition along with the mental illness. And um, it, it's, it's very valuable to have them a part of the team. But what, one thing I do want to make clear is if there's any, if there's ever any medical conditions in question, um, my team makes sure to stay within our scope um a behavioral health interventionist and we get the the person linked immediately with medical evaluation um first and foremost we want to make sure they're physically okay wow that's great that's awesome it really sounds like you really cover the gambit there <laughs> Um, now, what kind of training, someone asked, what kind of training does the MET team receive for risk assessment and management um, de-escalation? You did mention that you do receive some training for that, but what kind of training do you get for that? We do. We do a lot of training. Um, you know, in addition to the standard um, trainings that our department expects, you know, our department has expectations of a certain baseline of trainings that all behavioral health staff participate in. Um, some of the more specialized training that, that my staff have um, include the ASSIST model, which is evidence-based, and ASSIST stands for Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. And it really is a focus on um, talking about the reasons for living, talking about the reasons for dying, um, you know, and helping those who are experiencing suicidal ideation with safety planning and linking them with um, follow up treatment. Um, mm -hmm. My staff also um, have participated, our whole department is participating in the Zero Suicide Initiative, um, which, you know, just by the name alone, we want there to be zero suicide in Kern County. I think that's one thing we could all agree on. Um, and a part of that is the implementation and use of the screening form. Um, so it is my goal and my team's goal that we all use the screening form um, in every encounter that we have, if we're able to safely do so and it doesn't interfere with the intervention with the individuals we're responding to. So th those yeah. are a couple of different types of training we take. We also have access to an online training database called Relias. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it no. has a lot of different options for um, online trainings. And we also, in addition to these things, um, we also co-train and collaboratively train with our law enforcement uh, partners in crisis negotiations and different techniques. Oh, cool. Now, would that the crisis negotiations help you de-escalate a situation if someone is in acute psychosis or if they have a combination um, or um, with, you know, sometimes someone in, with autism can also have psychosis. Would that kind of training help you in those situations? Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you so much.
Um, just a few more. Um, thank you so much for your patience. These are really hard questions. They're in depth, and I appreciate your time answering them. Um, now, what is the criteria for 5150, and how do you go about assessing for to see if they need it or not? Right, that's a great question. And it's all about, all encompassing of what our team is here for. Um, so I appreciate that question. Um, when I was talking earlier about the LPS Act, the Lantern and Petra Short um, that was passed in 67, um, I just wanna reiterate that what we want to do at all costs is try to work collaboratively with the individuals we're serving and their families to try to get them to accept voluntary treatment. Um, and so with that being said, um, when we're doing a Welfare and Institutions Code 5150 evaluation, we're looking at a whole biopsychosocial spiritual vision of the people we're working with. Um, it's a very holistic evaluation my staff do. And when it comes down to it, we're looking that we can justify probable cause of detaining someone civilly against their will uh, for further psychiatric evaluation due to a mental health disorder that's resulting in them being either a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or gravely disabled. Um, the grave disability is what we're often asked about the most. Um, and gravely disabled means that due to a mental health disorder, the individual is unable to care for their basic needs or able to accept third party assistance to help with their basic needs. And those basic needs include food, clothing, and shelter. Wow. It sounds like you spend a lot of time evaluating these individuals. Yes. You know, I can tell you that the continuum of a crisis is such that Sometimes it takes five minutes um, because you can see the person has decompensated so much that sometimes people aren't able, they lack the capacity to agree to voluntary treatment sometimes. And I notice, you know, with your group um, for schizophrenia and psychosis, I would imagine that um, this would be more pertinent is when you have an individual who is unable to provide for their basic needs due to their mental health disorder. Um, and if you're looking at a grave disability situation, it's really important to weigh and measure, you know, this person is willing to get in the car with me right now and go voluntarily but they might, they might be willing to get in the car with anyone right now because of the symptoms they're you know, experiencing. And do they really have the capacity to make a decision about accepting voluntary treatment right now? So it can be very challenging at times to try to help preserve the patient's rights to be a part of and help direct their treatment. But at the same time, ensure their safety and that they're getting connected to treatment that will assist them in recovering. Emily, that's very astute of you and I'm so glad you brought that up because Fawn and I, being part of Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance, it is about decision-making capacity or therefore the lack of it. And um, it is a brain disorder and we do see a lot of anosognosia and that is lack of awareness or lack of capacity to make right. those decisions. So um, thank you for bringing that up. And we could do 10 shows on that alone. Yes. Um, so I really appreciate you bringing that up. And I'd like to talk to you sometime in the future more about that. Um, 
So what do you do if a person does qualify for 5150, but they don't want to go? Right. Um, so what we try to do, one thing that I always like to talk about is time is on our side. Um, when you're dealing with crisis intervention and behavioral health, um, what you notice, if you're able to effectively, effectively develop a rapport with someone and you're able to effectively engage someone um, over a period of time, um, there's going to be a, a natural decline in the um, escalation of the situation. And what we're going to see is people will slowly start returning to a baseline level of functioning. And, you know, I am speaking mostly in terms to someone who's experiencing a behavioral health disorder without having substances in their system, because sometimes that doesn't help over a short period of time. Um, but what we do is we try to effectively engage them to come with us safely in our MET vehicles. Um, one thing we want to do is take the stigma out of experiencing a behavioral health crisis because let's just face it, um, getting into the back of a patrol car um, isn't how most people would like to be transported somewhere. Um, and so if if my med staff are able to effectively work with that person to safely come with us in our car, um, we will we will write out the 5150 document that allows us to take them into custody civilly, to take them to a designated facility for further evaluation. Um, and if we aren't able to, that's when we have to coordinate and collaborate with our law enforcement partners to help us um, take them into custody and transport them to our designated facility. That can be very challenging. Um, yeah. there, are, there are times where um, we aren't able to take people who should be on a 5150 um, and these are few and far between. It doesn't happen often, but if someone is inside their home by themselves and they refuse to open the door, um, there's nothing we can do. Um, on, on the behavioral health side, we can continue to attempt engagements and we can continue to follow up, but it's not, you can't just break the door down and go in and drag someone out of their home and risk harming them when we were initially there to try to help them. So I, mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. That's, that's great. That, that's very, very um, detailed analysis of what you can and cannot do and why. I appreciate that. So if a person is with a family what can the family members do to help? Is there any information that they can share with you? I mean, anything that they can do behaviorally to help you out? Absolutely. So it's always first and foremost, if this is a behavioral health crisis in which a family member is calling 911 to request a check the welfare or any type of response from law enforcement because of a behavioral health crisis. Um, it, you have to be factual. You have to give real time reports of what's happening right now. Um, it's also important to give any pertinent history, um, you know, especially any recent history. Um, is your family member taking medications? what they are. Um, does your family member have a history of having weapons of any type? Um, a knife, a firearm, razor blades, anything that could cause harm to themselves or others. Um, are they receiving treatment anywhere? Um, if so, being able to have those phone numbers on hand for the treatment provider. Um, And I'm That's thinking, right, so, okay. 
That was, no, no, that's great. I didn't mean to interrupt you. So if these were written down and they could ahead of time even, and if they could give them to you, that would be helpful. That would be wonderful. Even if, okay. you know, I don't know to the extent that certain family members may be involved, but if they have a wrap plan, the wellness recovery action plan or any other type of safety plan, it would be good to have a copy of that on hand. Great. Great. That's good to know. That's something we can um, work with our families about and with as well. One last question, Emily, you've been so generous with your time and I really, really appreciate it. Going back to the virtual um, evaluation, how can, I'm just wondering, how can you evaluate someone in psychosis virtually if they're not willing to sit down in front of the device? We can't sometimes, um, and in those and in those situations, um, we go in person. So oh, okay. you know, it, it virtual doesn't work for everyone. I know a lot of us through the pandemic have been we've become a lot more comfortable with it, um, but some people aren't. Um, our high school kids love it because they're all about virtual, right? Um, yeah. And even sometimes when it's not due to psychosis, sometimes people just refuse to connect virtually. And in those instances, um, there may be a little bit of a delayed response time, but we will respond in person when it's needed. What we don't wanna do is have um, the medium of communication get in the way or interfere with our job. Gotcha. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything. This has really been a great presentation and wonderful answers to all these questions. Thank you. Do we have do, am I supposed to close out? <laughs> Hello? I'm wondering if I'm supposed to go now. <laughs> Do you want to close out on? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Perfect. Okay, I didn't see a cue here, but I'm going to go ahead and thank everybody for their time and for listening in. Emily, that was just fabulous. I know a lot of families uh, that we talk to uh, daily and um, email with about problems that they have uh, with a loved one, particularly those who are experiencing a um, psychotic break of some type need resources and they are typically frantic when they call or when they communicate with us and we need to be able to educate them on what these resources are and your presentation was providing fundamental information that people definitely need in a crisis that involves mental health um, we refer to as brain disability. I'm providing you with the MET contacts up here. Please take those down. Anybody who is uh, in need of this information or could be, these are critical phone numbers to have handy of your MET contacts. And believe me, I will be taking it down and providing the information also to many people who do need this uh, information. And again, uh, we want to let you know this is a presentation through schizophrenia and psychosis, uh, psychotic disorders, um, Alliance, Action Alliance of Kern County. And we will be providing additional information to families and those who can benefit from information on these disorders and how to get effective 
timely treatment for our loved ones. The uh, crisis hotline for current BHRS is being posted. Substance use access line, suicide prevention hotline, non-crisis adult services. These are all uh, information and phone numbers that you can obtain through the current BHRS website as well. So it's readily available information to you and um, those of us from um, uh, Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance know the benefits of being insistent on getting treatment, getting answers, getting uh, assistance as we can for our loved ones. Uh, our connection information is on the screen right now for a Schizophrenia and Psychosis, Psychosis Action Alliance, our website, Facebook page, and uh, any donations can be sent to this um, 501c3 nonprofit organization at the website that's posted. We appreciate your time and listening to this. We appreciate the time of, of Emily Lyles who presented at this interview and give us a, a call or connect with us on the website if you have any additional questions or if we might be able to assist in any way. Uh, thank you all very much for your time.